He's my comfort, always holds me close. Good morning. It's good to have all of you here. It's good to see the pews filling up again. And uh, we'll begin to see faces. That's all very exciting. Also want to welcome all of you who are joining us online uh, this morning at Worship in Grand Marais Evangelical Free Church. Uh, there are a few announcements in the bulletin, which you can get at our website. Uh, the primary announcement is that uh, next Saturday, on the 22nd, there will be a work day at Ocanto. Uh, so if you want to come out, there will be some brush clearing, some light carpentry, cleaning of cabins, and that sort of thing, raking. Uh, and they request that uh, you bring uh, water, snacks, and any tools or supplies you think you might need for any jobs that you feel you want to do. If you want more information or insight on what might be required, please give uh, the Salines a call and uh, ask for more information. Uh, but that workday is next Saturday. Uh, and that's pretty much it by way of announcements. Uh, the affirmation of faith this morning is the Apostles' Creed. Uh, and uh, we will read it in unison. You can find it in your bulletin or in the hymnal at the back. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we have gathered this morning because you are worthy. You are worthy of all that we have and all that we are. And we present ourselves to you this morning asking that your spirit would teach us how to worship you in spirit and truth. We praise you, Lord God, for all that you are. We praise you, Lord God, for being three in one. And we ask, Lord God, that um, this morning you would uh, teach us, that you would speak to us through your word so that we might understand what we need to do next. For we ask this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, family. Um, Uh, would you stand with us and pull open your um, your hymnals to 493, or your I guess you got the songs right there. So um, let's sing together, and I, I'm just so glad to see you all. So if I cry today, just keep singing, okay? When peace like a river attended my way when sorrows like sea billows roll Satan should buffet 
within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And renew a right spirit within me. So this next song is um, one that uh, that I just learned. So um, bear, bear with me as we maybe do some wrong chords and stuff, but it's all unto the Lord, and and this, uh, um, it's, it's just been such a great um, reminder to me, um, uh, this, the, the, the tremendous um, gift it is that the Holy Spirit lives in us, um, and as it will say in the song, um, that that is our victory, I mean, the blood, Jesus and his blood is our victory, but um, that carries out um, and works its way out through the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And, and um, we can experience that, um, the victory of Jesus Christ in our life through the Holy Spirit. And it's just been, it's just really encouraging. So I, um, if you don't want to sing, that's great. Just listen, um, but um, sing if you, if you will. Um, love you, Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. Defender behind me. I won't I'm filled with anointing My cup's overflowing No weapon can harm me my 
Hi. Have you guys seen one of these before? You know, things like this used to be really common in homes and even in cars. It's a map. Now, there are all different kinds of maps, and they show different things. This is a map that shows me water depths right here in Lake Superior and a little bit of information about the shoreline. And I use it, and I use it when I'm kayaking. Most adults here have used a road map before. It helps us to find our way to get somewhere where we've never been before. Maps also come in books, like this trail guide. This book contains a map. First it gives me instructions on how to find the trail, and then the map shows me how to follow the trail. Now this book also has some neat information on things that I might find interesting along the way, and also things I should probably look out for so I don't get into trouble. Imagine if you were lost and all you had were maps or books, and you had to search and search and find where you are, and then find where you're trying to go and figure out the best way to get there. 
you might find that you were lost because you were going in the complete wrong direction and you have to turn around to get on the right track. You know, roadmaps are almost becoming obsolete thanks to smartphones and GPS. Almost everyone has an app on their phone that not only gives directions, but also shows you exactly where you are all the time. Now, this can be really helpful, maybe unless you live up here and you don't have a lot of service. But have you ever walked into a bookstore and noticed that one of the biggest sections in the bookstore is the self-help section? You can find books on just about everything from making money to finding love to gardening or even just being happier. You know, but just like these maps and books can sometimes get outdated, uh, sometimes we might not be able to trust what we find in those books. But God has given us a guidebook for life, and it's his word, the Bible. You see, God knows exactly where we are all the time. He knows if we've gotten off track, and he knows the right way for us to go. And he's given us a lot of instructions in his word, in the Bible. And he wants us to seek him and to follow his word. You know, sometimes we might find that we were going the wrong direction. But the only way to get back on track is to turn around and start following what God says for us to do. So here's your encouragement from me to seek God uh, in the word that he's given us. Let it show you the right way to live um, and the way to honor God. And I think you'll probably find that when you seek him and seek what he wants for you, uh, maybe you will find love in him for sure. You will uh, you probably find some happiness in thankfulness and gratitude and in joy for all that he's done for you. And it will result in praise. And that's a good way to be happy. Um, in the Bible, Psalm 119, 9 and 10 says this, How can a young man, that's right, even you young people, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. And then verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Thanks, Beth. This week's uh, um, special prayer focus is on Mount Rose Community Church, and uh, uh, Jeff Adelson uh, will be uh, leading us in prayer uh, to start off. From Mount Rose, thank you for, for that, that we get to hang and furnish, and thank you that we got to hang out with that we get to hang out at Mount Rose on Sunday. In Jesus' name, we, we pray, Mount Rose, amen. amen. And we pray for effective outreach through uh, hiking, fishing, canoeing, camping. Uh, we pray for um, the Warrior Leadership Summit for the youth. Uh, that would be um, a fruitful conference for them. And we just pray for um, all the other ways that um, outreach is taking place throughout the community, uh, and we ask that uh, your hand would be on the on the believers there, <coughs> guiding them with your spirit, and that your spirit would go ahead of us and soften the hearts of the people. Um, yeah, we give this all into your hands, Lord, in Jesus' name, Amen. Let's continue in prayer together. Lord God, we give you thanks for your presence here. We give you thanks again, Lord God, that um, you invite us to pray for one another. We don't always know what is best. We don't always know what you have in mind for another person. But we can't go far wrong by praying for the good that we can imagine and then listening for your spirit's response. You always take our desire, our love for the person that we're praying for and add it to your love and amplify it into blessing. So we lift up to you our friends, Jean, Jesse, 
Jean, Jesse, Nancy, and David. We also give you thanks, Lord God, for the answers to prayer that you have given for Vicki and for Elsa and for others. We think about uh, the world right now, Lord God, and uh, it, it's, it's, it is certainly beyond anything that we can affect or do, but in prayer we can still care um, well beyond our means. And we pray for the nation of India uh, and the, the uh, uh, plague that is uh, eating them alive right now in COVID and ask that you would, that you would um, bring healing to that people. We pray that uh, your spirit would uh, speak to the people of India and uh, uh, tell them of your grace, give them peace and direction. We pray also for the whole Middle East, Lord God, uh, and for the claim and counterclaims that uh, arise constantly, uh, for the civil war that's been going on in Syria, for the, uh, the uh, uh, and continue in Lebanon the, and, and in Israel itself. Uh, and Lord, we just lift that region up to you and ask that you would step in because these are nations that are being led and, and destroyed by spiritual powers and entities that for some reason uh, just keep resurfacing there. And we ask for your salvation. And we ask for your peace. We ask also, also Lord, that you would give all of us wisdom and uh, a, a real deep concern uh, to be good witnesses to your gospel to those around us. For we ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is uh, Amy and uh, Diane will be repeating what we read last week. And it's taken from Isaiah 33 and 35, if you want to follow along. Remember this portion of the story of God as it is written in the book that we love, from the book of Isaiah, chapters 33 and 35. Woe to you, O destroyer, while you were not destroyed, and he who is treacherous while others did not deal treacherously with him. As soon as you finish destroying, you will be destroyed. As soon as you cease to deal treacherously, Others will deal treacherously with you. O oh Lord, be gracious to us. We have waited for you. Be their strength every morning. Our salvation also in times of distress. At the sound of the tumult, peoples flee. At the lifting up of yourself, nations disperse. Your spoil is gathered as the caterpillar gathers as locusts rushing about, men rush about on it. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness, and he will be the stability of your times, a wealth of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Behold, their brave men cry in the streets. The ambassadors of peace weep bitterly. The highways are desolate. The traveler has ceased. He has broken the covenant. He has despised the cities. He has no regard for man. The land mourns and pines away. Lebanon is shamed and withered. Sharon is like a desert plain, and Bashan and Carmel lose their foliage. Now I will arise, says the Lord, now I will be exalted. Now I will be lifted up. You have conceived chaff. You will give birth to stubble. My breath will consume you like a fire. The peoples will be burned to lime, like cut thorns which are burned in the fire. You who are far away, hear what I have done. And you who are near, acknowledge my might. Sinners in Zion are terrified. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can live with consuming fire? 
Who among us can live with continual burning? He who walks righteously and speaks with sincerity. He who rejects unjust gain and shakes his hands so that they hold no bribe. He who stops his ears from hearing about bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking upon evil. He will dwell on the heights. His refuge will be the impregnable rock. His bread will be given to him and his water will be sure. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will behold a far distant land. Your heart will meditate on terror. Where is he who counts? Where is he who weighs? Where is he who counts the towers? You will no longer see a fierce people, a people of unintelligible speech which no one comprehends, of a stammering tongue which no one understands. Look upon Zion, the city of our appointed feasts. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, an undisturbed habitation, a tent which will not be folded. Its stakes will never be pulled up, nor any of its cords be torn apart. But there, the majestic one, the Lord, will be for us a place of wide rivers and canals, on which no boat with oars will go and on which no mighty ship will pass. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Your tackle hangs slack. It cannot hold the base of its mass firmly nor spread out the sail. Then the prey of an abundant spoil will be divided. The lame will take the plunder, and no resident will say, I am sick, for the people who dwell there will be forgiven their iniquity. The wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the Arab will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the Arabah. The scorched land will become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, its resting place, grass becomes reeds and rushes. A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way. And fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there but the redeemed will walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful singing to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy, and all sorrow and all sighing will flee away. The word of the Lord. Amen. If you haven't already, I'd like you to please turn to uh, Isaiah chapter 33, and I'll be referring to 33 and 35. Today's reading is the last in a series of six woes, or warnings, in Isaiah 28 to 33. 
Warnings, generally speaking, to God's people against trusting the world system for their survival and their success. However, this time, the woe is a warning not to Israel, not to Judah, not to uh, its friends, but to its enemies, to the predator, not the prey. Woe to you, O destroyer. The destroyer in this passage is described as treacherous and deceitful. He betrays the trust that others put in his contracts and commitments and his treaties. In Isaiah's day, the destroyer was clearly Assyria. We even have a story that we'll read about later about how Judah, hoping to avoid invasion and destruction, stripped God's temple of all of its gold, including the gold leaf that was on uh, the, some of the base relief uh, carvings, and they sent all of it to the Assyrians as a payoff to avoid invasion and destructions. Assyria took the gold, agreed to the conditions, and then invaded anyway. But Isaiah's prophecies, as we have often found, often have a far future or end times application as well. Verses 5 to 6 in chapter 33 refer to a time when the salvation of God will be completely fulfilled. Now, that didn't happen in Isaiah's day, and it hasn't happened yet in our day, but it will be completely fulfilled in that end time. And that's uh, the other sense of this whole prophecy. In this sense, the ultimate destroyer is death, or Satan, the liar and the treacherous serpent in the Garden of Eden, and in the heart of the world's darkness and chaos, as we read in earlier prophecies from Isaiah. So this prophecy has relevance not just to Isaiah and Judah of Isaiah's day, but to us here and now. We read, overall, the big picture is that God will hold the kingdoms of the world accountable for their deeds. It's not being shrugged off. It's not going unnoticed. But he will also, he also sees that there is more going on than just what we see at the hands of men. There is a spiritual battle going on, and it is indeed the battle that is, the energy goes out from that into all of the rest of creation. And the supreme spiritual leader of the kingdoms of the world is Satan, and he will be held accountable as well. Chapter 33, verse 14, describes God as a consuming fire and a continual burning that will hold all of creation, the seen and the unseen, accountable for their sin. When the question is asked, who among us can live with a consuming fire? Who among us can live with a continual burning? The answer is the righteous. Isaiah 33 describes righteousness as it actually appears in the people of God uh, in three instances, as the prayer of the righteous, the holiness of the righteous, and the hope of the righteous. The, righteous, the prayer of the righteous is in chapter 33, verses 2 to 6. O Lord, be gracious to us. We have waited for you. Be their strength and their mourning, our salvation also in the time of distress. At the sound of the tumult, peoples flee. At the lifting up of yourself, nations disperse. Your spoil is gathered as the caterpillar gathers, as locusts rushing about men rush about on it. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness, and he will be the stability of our time, your times a wealth of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Now, some of you English uh, geeks out there will notice there is this constant shift of pronouns that's unusual from first and second to third. Uh, uh, that's because this little prayer that I just read is a snippet of a larger liturgical prayer or a community prayer that has parts for the congregation and for worship leaders. Um, uh, maybe the worship leaders were priests. Um, the leaders' parts speak descriptively about 
both God and the worshipers, in the third person. The pronouns he, she, they. The worshiper parts tend to speak personally to God in the first and second person, I, we, you. This format, and, and it's, it's a, yes, it's a trivia question, but the format tells us something important about the prayer of the righteous, and that is, first of all, uh, that the righteous are perfected in community. We are not lone rangers. We're not meant to be. Now, this doesn't mean, this is not a, condemn, a condemnation of individual prayer, hardly, but it is an, exhort, an exhortation to join to pray, to come together to pray, especially prayers of repentance. And this is a prayer of repentance. The verses that follow, and, and to get an idea of, of the spirit, of the, what drove the people to repentance, we can read the verses just after the ones I uh, read, verses 7 to 9. Uh, where it says, Behold, their brave men cry in the streets. The ambassadors of peace weep bitterly. The people were terrified. They were, they were hopeless because of their helplessness. They had done everything they could, and it all had come to nothing. They had acted as if they, and not God, were responsible for the survival of Israel and the success of its mission. In repentance, they reaffirm that God's will be done and his kingdom come. And you take a look at verse 6. And he will be the stability of your times, a wealth of salvation, wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. It turns out that repentance is not just about turning away from sin. It is most certainly that. But before, it, it, it occurred to me that before it is that, it is almost always this coming to terms with the fact that we have replaced God uh, as sovereign in our life and in the world around us. And the first act of repentance is to put God back on the throne of our life, and of the world around us. We're so good at giving prayers to God that give him directions on how he needs to act to straighten things out. The fear of the Lord is the treasure of the faithful believer. It is the necessary attitude if God is to give us his righteousness as his own, to fear that we have taken God's place instead of him is the fear of the Lord. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, that first portion of it is a prayer of repentance, remembering that God is in heaven and asking that his will would be done and that his kingdom would come. Because of their repentant heart, even if it is at the 11th hour and they've come to the end of their rope, God rises up and says to the destroyer in verses 11 12, you have conceived chaff. You will give birth to stubble. My breath will consume you like a fire. The peoples will be burned to lime, cut like cut thorns which are burned in the fire. <clears throat> because his people have returned to him, God will destroy the destroyer. And this is, we will see in the next chapters we study about the story of Hezekiah that this is true in the history of the people of Judah and Jerusalem and uh, Isaiah that heard Isaiah's preaching. And it is also true about our future. God is going to destroy the destroyer. So the question is, so is that all there is to our relationship with God's grace? We just say we're sorry and ask God to get us out of the jam that we've gotten ourselves into and like a doting grandfather, God obliges, and then we go back to living our life our way. No, God intends for us to grow. The fact of the matter is that most of the time, we have to get to the end of ourselves and to the 11th hour, and we realize that we are hopeless if we continue in the direction we go. But that is not an, meant to be an endless cycle. God expects and wants us, and we should want for ourselves to grow beyond that. God intends for us to grow. He intends for us to share in his holiness. So repentance and the prayer of repentance should lead 
to the next step of obedience, which is learning the holiness of God. Now, in this passage that we read from Isaiah, the first lesson of the process of holiness or sanctification, as it says in the New Testament, is a question raised by sinners, not a teaching taught by Isaiah or the faithful, but a question raised by sinners in Zion who are witnessing the fearful truth about God's sense of justice. In verse 33, chapter... um, Chapter 33, verse 14. Sinners in Zion are terrified. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can live with the consuming fire? Who among us can live with the continual burning? The sinners in Zion, and let's face it, (laughs) which which of us are not sinners? Even the Apostle Paul recognized that he was still a sinner and found that he he still could not chase it from his life. So this is a message to all of us about holiness. The sinners in Zion teach us that we fear the wrong things. We fear the Assyrians in our lives, the threats to our safety, the threats to our efforts to build our families, our homes, our lives, our careers, We fear any threat to whatever empire we are building. So we ask God and we relate to God as if it is his responsibility and his role in life to protect us and to make, to establish the work of our hands. And oftentimes, instead of saying that, thinking we're trying to do what God has called us to do and asking him for his power to do it, we're asking God to establish our work, our our ideas of our empire. We ask God what relevance he has to the solution of our problems. And so often, when he seems disinterested in serving our ambitions, we dismiss him to make other arrangements to safeguard our interests. Those arrangements can be economic, they can be political, emotional, or relational. We fear the Assyrian threats to our own little kingdoms when, as the sinners in Zion found out, we ought instead to be very afraid of the God whose holy life and life will burn away all that is not in his best interest, all that is not his idea of glory. We fear the wrong things. We fear the threats to our empire, our well-being. What the scripture teaches over and over again is, no, be afraid of being on the wrong result of the burning of God. God's holiness is a burning fire and a burning light. It is either a love that purifies and perfects or a judgment that purifies and destroys. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. God wants for us to want what he wants. You can put that on a t-shirt. God wants for us to want what he wants. And what is that? He wants us to want abundant life from his perspective, what he calls abundant life. And holiness is actually the abundant life of God whose piercing light reveals death and decay in every corner of our lives and whose justice knows that death must be rooted out if God's love is ever to bear fruit in our life. God's justice has to take place or his love cannot thrive. His love cannot accomplish what he wants it to do. Holiness is not a sterile spiritual field. That's how we see it when we're afraid of God because we see it as sinners, a threat to our own plans and empire building. But the truth of the matter is that God's God's holiness is this fusion reactor of life and truth 
that, that creates abundance. God's holiness is, is irresistible and unstoppable in the end. It will burn away all that is fake so that only that which is true and living and loving can remain. God's love is a consuming fire. I'd like to read chapter 33, verses 14b to 15. Who among us can live with a consuming fire? Who among us can live with continual burning? He who walks righteously and speaks with sincerity, who rejects unjust gain and shakes his hands so that they hold no bribe. He who stops his ears from hearing about bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking upon evil. He will dwell on the heights. His refuge will be the impregnable rock. His bread will be given to him and his water will be sure. God is calling repentant believers to join their hearts and minds to his heart and mind. Not to repeat over and over again the endless cycle of getting to the end of ourselves and coming to act to God and asking him to clean up the mess. Although, let's face it, there will be a lot of that. But God's hope and our hope is that we can take a next step. We can join in something that will build permanence. Something in our life that, that will carry with us into the next life. We hear so much of what you can't take with you. But what Christ would build in us would be permanence. Would be something that will that will be purified by the refining fire of God's love, not destroyed. God is calling us to join our hearts and minds to his, to reject lies and to commit to truth-telling, to reject profit when it requires a shortcut around honesty, to refuse a bribe even when it's just part of the system, to reject plans that prey on the weak, and to take notice and to do something about evil that is done to others because injustice is everyone's business in the kingdom of God. Such actions <laughs> don't make us righteous by themselves. I mean, everybody who has ever tried to do what is right, if they're honest with themselves and if if they're really trying to do it and not just put a little window dressing on, everyone, our best efforts at righteousness almost always serve to show us how unrighteous and how selfish we truly are. What's more, as we enter into the discipleship and the obedience to God as, as followers of him, we frequently find that the school of godly obedience and faith can include a sizable tuition fee that seems way more than we can afford. But Hebrews 12.10 tells us he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. And his holiness is life, abundant life. The consuming fire of God's holiness will burn away all that has not been built in us by the Spirit of Christ. All that we have selfishly built for ourselves according to our own limited wisdom. The lesson of holiness is if we fear only that our short-sighted selfishness will keep Christ from building anything eternal and true in us. And if that holy fear keeps us always returning again and again in repentance and surrender to him, then God can transform every other fear in our life into hope, a lasting hope that cannot be overcome by any destroyer, seen or unseen, a hope that God's consuming fire will only purify and perfect. If we fear only that our short-sighted selfishness 
will keep Christ from building anything eternal and true in us, then we understand what it is to fear God. He turns all fear, every lesser fear, into hope when that is our only fear. And what is our hope? Let me read verse 17 and 20 to 21. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty, and they will behold a far distant land. And 20 to 21. Look upon Zion, the city of our appointed feasts. I like the idea of appointed feasts. Mandatory feasts, yes, mandatory feasting. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, an undisturbed habitation, a tent which will not be folded. Its stakes will never be pulled up, nor any of its cords be torn apart. But there, the majestic one, the Lord, will be for us. Our king in his beauty and a far distant land. Regarding the beauty of our king, I can't help but think, uh, think of the last verse of Anne Ross Cousins' hymn, The Sands of Time Are Sinking. It's a great hymn. I don't know why we ever quit singing it. Uh, the poetry in it is powerful, and, and the imagery is, is wonderful. The last uh, verse is, The bride eyes not her garments, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze on glory, but on my king of grace. Not at the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hands. The lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's lamb. I also can't help but remember <clears throat> Tolkien's very descriptive phrase, a glimpse of paradise, uh, in the phrase, the simple phrase, a far green country under a swift sunrise. The author of Hebrews said, of the great heroes of the Old Testament. All these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return but as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Our hope is sustained by the beauty of our king and the far distant land that he is preparing for us. But it affects not only our hopes, but our fears will change as well, as it says in verses 18 to 19 your heart will meditate on terror. In other words, at one point you meditated on terror. Where is he who counts? Where is he who weighs? Where is he who counts the towers? This is, this would be the accountant from Assyria that comes and basically adds up the worth of a city as they determine what their tribute will be. So this is a tax assessment of a conquered people by its conquerors. That's what's going on here. That will no longer, your heart will no longer meditate on this terror. You will no longer see a fierce people, a people of unimaginable speech, which no one comprehends, of a stammering tongue, which no one understands. <clears throat> we won't be ruled by the terrors of this world and its Assyrian hordes, whatever they are. We may well be afraid, and rightfully so, but the beauty of our king's face and the homeland and the promise of the homeland he is building for us to share with him can supply the courage to resist those fears and remain faithful. In chapter 35, verses 5 to 6, we read, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and a tongue of the mute will shout for joy for the waters will break forth in the wilderness and the streams in the Arabah. We will not 
we will not be pulled from the fire of God's holiness, a charred wreck. Instead, all of our senses will be awakened. I used to think this was for all the people, and it is, for all the people who were born or through accident became lame or blind or deaf or dumb. But it's really to all of us, every single one of us. What we will see and what we will hear when we are made whole by God's love, that abundant life that Christ is talking about, will make us think that we have been deaf and blind all along. Our tongue will be able to sing and to speak with such satisfying eloquence and power that we will say that we were voiceless before we entered the fire. Our language will be joy itself. Our limbs and our whole body. I just spent a few hours a day this last week working on the wood pile. <laughs> I'm looking forward to leaping and, and having a brand new body all over again. I wouldn't mind just getting one like I had when I was 20, but uh, our limbs and our whole body will explore heaven and earth. And it will do it with, with a speed and an inexhaustible power that we see now in envy in the animals, the deer. Righteousness begins with repentance. Righteousness bears fruit when God shares his holiness with us. Righteousness is sustained by the beauty of our king and the goodness of the homeland he's making for us. Prophecy isn't all doom and gloom. It's also about redemption, reconciliation, and sanctification. It's about abundant life and great joy for all who will seek God on his terms and accept his holiness. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion. With everlasting joy upon their heads, they will find gladness and joy. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. Let's pray. Lord, we look forward to that day when sorrow and sighing will flee. And we ask, and I ask for myself and these people, we don't ask for greatness, we don't ask for wealth, we ask, Lord Jesus, to be found faithful. For we ask this in the name of Christ, amen. Let the 
angels to beckon me nearer my God to thee nearer my God to thee nearer to thee nearer my God Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. <laughs>